Okay, so Robert, maybe you can start. All right. Okay, good. Uh, well, thank you, Pina. And I, I'd like to thank you also for inviting me because, uh, well, I can share some things with the world again from long distance. And uh, the questions yesterday were interesting. And I actually spent some time trying to incorporate a little bit so that the audience is interested. And um, then I was thinking about my title and it's called rigorous aspects, but actually I tell very little rigorous things. So I think the better title would have been mathematical and practical aspects. And, uh, but then you will see what, what this entails. Okay. Um, okay. So let me continue with the next. Good. Okay. I think I just had to, yeah, it was open. Okay. So I wanted to just say a few things that are kind of going on right now in green function theory, um, at least what I am aware of, because I'm a little bit more in the non-equilibrium green function theory. And there, um, we actually see a quite uh, quick development from applying non-equilibrium green functions to real systems. And the main reason for that is uh, actually numerical. So there have been an approximate. So there's been a, a new scheme called uh, the generalized kind of BAME approach that simplifies the kind of BAME equations to one-time equations. And that made, uh, yeah, that gave a big boost in applications. I'll come back to that too. And it actually turns out to be a, a one matrix functional. It's kind of interest for the people that are interested in that. And secondly, um, yeah, I want to focus on, on developments extending the physical applications beyond the appro approximation that we use now, like GW. This is to include new phenomena, like in, but not necessarily in a strongly correlated regime. So like new phenomena, like double plasmons in, 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 in the electron gas or, or solids or whatever. And when we try to do so, we actually ran into these mathematical challenges. So this is actually the main reason that I'm interested in these math mathematical challenges, because typically a physicist is not so interested as long as the method works, right? So, but as soon as things go wrong, uh, well, you get interested in certain issues and actually you get also important insights, turns out. Okay, what I will not address is uh, strongly correlated systems, but of course they're very important, but simply because it's rather difficult to get ideas on that. But I will come back to some of these issues. Okay. Um, okay, so, it, ah, yeah, okay. So I come to the overview. So I first talk a little bit about um, the Schrodinger equation in general uh, and, and, and density matrices, then about the self-energy. And then there was some issues mentioned yesterday about domains in differentiability. So I decided to address this topic a bit. And then I will come back to a few schemes um, relating to choosing domains. And uh, OK, you can read the title. Um, secondly, more on the issue of notation, I will use green functions in general. But uh, this can be anything. It can be non-equilibrium, equilibrium. And the algebraic structure of everything looks just the same. It's just a matter of choice of time contours. and. It doesn't really matter. So if you are a zero temperature person, then you can read everything as time orders, uh, zero temperature green functions. Or if you're a Matsubarov person, you can read everything as Matsubarov and so on. Okay, now the many body problem. Okay, so this is the only rigorous slide that I have. <laughs> it's about the, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. That's a well-defined problem. Uh, you have n particles. That means that you have free n space coordinates. And we have uh, corresponding spin coordinates that can be up or down. And we have a well-defined Hamiltonian with the kinetic energy T with a, an external perturbation V that can be time dependent and typically a two body interaction. And uh, this is a well-defined mathematical problem as already mentioned yesterday by Eric Kansen. Uh, Cato already determined uh, the classes of potentials for which this operator is self-adjoint. It belongs to certain mathematical spaces. And for the time dependent Schrodinger equation, you also need some other conditions. I think these are really nicely pointed out in this paper by Marco Spence that I cite below. Yeah, so that's the time dependent Schrodinger equation. It's nice and beautiful. Hilbert space is nice and beautiful because you have a superposition principle. It's all elegant. The only problem is that it's big, you know, you need we have many variables. And that means that in practice, we cannot really solve the Schrodinger equation. 
except for small systems. So the next step you could think of is saying, well, let's integrate out a bunch of coordinates. So, so let's say I have the coordinates y of particles p plus one to n that I'm not interested in, I integrate them out. So what I do is take psi times psi star and I integrate out the, the variables y and then I keep x and x prime, which are coordinates x1 to xp and x1 prime to xp prime. I, I keep them there and I get an object that is called the p-particle density matrix. Now, this is a much smaller object. It can be like one particle, two particle, and so on. And it satisfies a set of equations that it's typically known as the BBGKY hierarchy equations. And they are spelled out here. Um, we have two body interactions and we have this little h, which is the one body part of the Hamiltonian. It contains the one particle kinetic energy and the potential. Okay, so for example, the first uh, equation in hierarchy involves the one particle density matrix and it's related to the two particle density matrix by the interactions here. So that's a nice equation, except that we don't know how the two particle density matrix depends on the one particle density matrix. Then you can say, well, okay, let's see if this object uh, has a nice equation. Okay, the BBJKY hierarchy tells me that I have this equation here, where I have a gamma two relating to gamma three, and so on. And then we have the problem of determining gamma three and so on. Now, what people typically try to do is to find a decoupling scheme. So for example, you could say maybe gamma three is zero, you know, and then I solve for gamma two and I plug the gamma two in here and I get the gamma one or, or something a bit more sophisticated. Okay, like, like gamma three is gamma one times gamma two or so, something like that. Um, however, yeah, this is not a semi-systematic procedure, but you can you can, you can try to do so. I spent some time doing that in the past with, with Ali Akbari and Javed Hashimi in some paper. And what we found out that it's even reasonable approximations run into difficulties. And the difficulties are due to the fact that if you simply do time propagation, which we did on some Hubbard systems, that after a while, the density matrices, they become negative, for example. So they're not positive operators anymore. The occupation numbers become negative and the whole thing blows up. So, so it seems that you have to choose your decoupling scheme in such a way that you always satisfy the representability conditions. So, so that's an issue and it's not so easy to solve. Um, well, a few years later, I saw a paper by this one assigned by Luckner where they actually enforce during the time evolution, the unrepresentability conditions that are known in the constraint potential and then things behave much more nicely. Okay, so this is an interesting scheme, but but um, at some point I left it and, and, and went back to the green functions. Okay, I'll come back to this at the end of the talk again. Okay, so the green function. So already Eric Cancel yesterday explained the one particle green function. What I will do is, is to start with the n particle green function. It's essentially the same object. Instead of creating one particle, I create n particles. And after a certain time, I, I remove them again. And the amplitude for that is called the n-particle green function. Now the n-particle green function also satisfied a set of hierarchy equations very closely related to the, to the BBJKY. Not a surprise because the equal time limit of GN is actually the n-particle density matrix. So, so that equation is simply an equation that relates the n-particle green function to the n plus one and the n minus one particle green function. And we also have boundary conditions if you work in the in non-equilibrium theory or non-equilibrium theory with, with initial Matsubara branch, then these conditions are the uh, kubo martin swinger conditions. If you're interested in zero temperature formalism, then you have to take um, beta cos to infinity limit of these boundary conditions and do a contour rotation. But that's, that's more like technicalities. So this is also in principle an exact scheme. For example, the, the first equation uh, relates to one particle green function to the two particle green function. And then we have, for example, an equation that relates to the two particle green function to the three particle green function. Okay. This is just as awkward as before. However, now if we put the interaction to zero, we have an equation that relates the non interacting n particle green function to the non interacting n minus one particle green function. And that actually can be solved. 
Uh, and the solution is simply this determinant here. The gen is a determinant of, of one particle transformation, and this is called Wick's theorem. So this derivation is already in the original Martin Swinger paper, where he did it for the Matsubara, but it's just as valid for Nanocube. So that's really nice because it kind of gives us some kind of decoupling scheme in perturbation theory. So, so if you use this procedure for, uh, for GN, we can expand the n particle brain function. And if you do that, then you use uh, purely top topological considerations, you use Feynman graphs and you classify them according to their topology, you can actually arrive at this equation, which is known as the Dyson equation, right? So you have G is G0 plus G0 sigma times G as an integral, or you can write it as, um, as an equation of motion. But now sigma G is given by a sum of uh, diagrams. And, and these diagrams are called so-called skeleton diagrams. That means that they do not fall apart by cutting two green function lines. So, or, or as particle physicists would say, they are two particle irreducible or a two line irreducible. Or you can also say they don't contain self energy insertions. And so yeah, you can view each diagram as a mapping from a graph, a Feynman graph for a given G to a complex number. And, uh, and you sum this graph. So if this series converges, then this defines uh, the exact functional. Okay, so this is uh, a kind of systematic expansion of the exact functional. It's something people don't have in DFT, but we have in green function theory. It doesn't mean that it's easy to calculate, but, but we have it. Okay. Um, now a remark. So actually last week, uh, Martinus Veltman, the Nobel Prize winner in physics died. And I remember the guy because he was a teacher in Utrecht when I was a student there. And he wrote a really nice book. It's called Dia Grammatica. And um, one of the nice things of this book is that it has no e equation numbers. So he said, uh, if I don't use equation numbers, I have to be clear. So, <laughs> um, But he made this kind of uh, comments about the status of, of, um, of many body perturbation theory or quantum field theory that he says perturbation theory means Feynman diagrams. It appears therefore that anyone working in elementary particle physics, experimentalist or theorist needs to know about these objects. Okay. Here there is a most curious situation. The resulting machinery is far better than the originating theory. There are formalisms that in the end produce final rules starting from the basic ideas of quantum mechanics. However, these formalisms have flaws and defects and no derivation exists that can be called satisfactory. So this actually reminded me of, of the, the whole issue of this workshop where yesterday after, um, after the talk of Eric Conseil, there was some kind of big question mark. Okay, how do we do define many body perturbation theory in a, in a rig rigorous mathematical framework? And, uh, in particle physics, the situation is even worse because even the, the single Feynman diagrams themselves um, are infinite and have to be regularized in some way. And there, for example, there is even theorems that interacting quantum field theory doesn't even live in the same Hilbert space as the non-interacting one. So this um, doesn't is not the case in non-relativistic uh, non systems, but still, uh, the, still, still the situation arises. Okay, the thing that I want to address more specifically is simply for which approximations we can actually solve the Dyson equation. And we will see that this is actually an issue if you go beyond GW. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so we, we tried something beyond GW and we found out a few things that also were somehow scattered in the literature known here and there is that if you go beyond GW or T matrix or any of the standard approximations, then you get non analyticities that actually prevent the self-consistent solution of the Dyson equation. And this is mainly due to the fact that you can create negative particle densities and, and spectral functions. This has also other consequences, for example, to time dependent density functional theory, it leads to issues with the solvability, for example, of the champs lettre equation. And after some analysis, it turns out that a lot of these practical issues, they are related to the main issues. Um, in particular, that the fact that the green functions that are input in these green functions need to have a particular structure. And, and I want to kind of elucidate this structure. 
Um, and then the related mathematical issue, the definition of the function space in which the green function lives, because you can add wave functions. It's you have the superposition principle. It's not natural, natural to add green functions. So green functions not naturally belong to a vector space. Um, how to define a proper Feynman graph. So what are the possible green functions that give nice integrals that are finite? And then the question is, can we actually sum all these finite numbers even if they are finite, which is a convergence issue. Then there was a, a nice presentation yesterday by Christian Pruder on the functional differentiability. And I want to give a little bit different take on that because in some cases, uh, things are rather simple. So the functions are rather simple. Um, so a Feynman graph is actually a rather simple object um, because it only involves products of green functions. So it's like a, it's like a polynomial or a convoluted poly polynomial in, in green functions. And that means that you can actually define the functional derivative in a purely topological way. So, so it doesn't involve the discussion of the underlying Banach space. So if I have a, a Feynman graph, say G or calligraphic G, and then I can define the derivative of the graph to be the sum of graphs GJ, where I remove uh, subsequently an edge J. And match is a, is a green function. So for example, if I have this graph, I can remove this line and that line that gives, gives one of these graphs, I can remove this line and this line that gives this graph and I can remove two other lines that give a third graph. And that by definition, it defines my functional derivative. And in the end, that's all you need to, to couple these equations. So also, also for the beta of Peter and so on. So for example, if I have the, the, the five functional that people talked about, I can remove the G lines and I get sigma. So in general, I can um, simply do differentiation by topology in this, this way. Okay, so that is one way to avoid the discussion of function spaces. Okay, it's, it's not perfect because we still have to think for which green functions the Feynman graph is well-defined, but it's, it's one of the reasons um, when Gianluca Stefanucci and I wrote the textbook that we decided to do everything diagrammatically because there is a, in, a quite a big issue with the functional de derivative derivations of, of things. Anyway, it's, it's one way to get around this. Well, a useful application is, is, is to derive the equations of motion from an action principle. This was already uh, discussed yesterday before. So in non-equilibrium Green's function, this is actually an action for finite temperature Green's function. This is actually the grand potential. And um, well, the, the, the functional derivative gives this. By the way, these terms can also be expanded diagrammatically. So, so they have diagrammatic representations and can be differentiated the way I mentioned. OK, so then there was a question yesterday, and I thought, I add a few lines to address that question, uh, whether this stationary point of this thing is actually a minimum. Well, <clears throat> in general, it is actually not. Uh, I think the first person that talked about it was Gordon Baim in his paper, and he shows that the Hessian of this thing is the beta subvert in the inverse beta sub Peter kernel, which is an object, space-time object, which has not fixed uh, sign of eigenvalues. That's all. So it can be, this, you, know, you can have positive and negative eigenvalues, and therefore, in general, you deal with a critical point. So not, not necessarily maximal. However, for certain approximations, for certain domain restrictions, you can actually prove that the Klein form has a minimum property. This is an old paper that we did with Ulf von Bart and Niels Erik Dahlen, but it's it's a, a specific case. But in general, I would say it's um, it's a critical point, which can also be viewed. If, I mean, if you think this can also be written as a path integral, for example, and then you see that it really amounts to something that is actually close to the Lagrangian principle rather than, than the Raleigh Ritz principle. Okay, just to address that issue. Another important issue is that here we see a logarithm, and this is a multi valued function in general. Um, so you have to make sure that, it, uh, that the functions inside are such that it doesn't. Um, Cross the branch cut of the logarithm. This is also a related issue that we'll talk about and depends on, requires a proper domain restriction. Okay. 
Then uh, some references. So there was also a mention yesterday of the Legendre transforms. Eric Hans uh, um, discussed the papers by Michael Potthoff. But in fact, this, this whole procedure of the Legendre transform relating G and Sigma and even the five functional actually goes back to the old papers of the Dominici and, and, and Paul Martin, which is the same Martin of Martin Swinger, who wrote two papers. I think they're cited quite a lot in statistical physics um, about essentially the energy as a function of the green function or the ground potential. Uh, one paper is purely algebraic and, and one is purely diagrammatic. Actually, I met Paul Martin 20 years ago. I uh, had some time to chat with him about his papers and he said that, yeah, the, the diagrammatic part was written by Dominici. I didn't understand it, but I believe he's a good guy, so it's probably correct. <laughs> but anyway, um, these are really, I think, really good papers. And I think um, uh, people should read them. Um, I did some work on that, on these papers too, and came up with some other functionals that are maybe interesting for discussing. Um, well, it was used in deriving functionals, or not of the green function and 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 uh, external potential, but of the green function and the um, and the irreducible four vertex or or the, the Bethesel Petri kernel. So the stationary points are are essentially the Dyson and the Bethesel Petri equation. Anyway, this is something. I don't want to talk about now, so it's just for a remark. Okay, then there was also a question on perturbation theory, whether it converges or not, and whether it's anything rigorous is known. And I thought maybe I throw in a slide um, on what I know about it. Um, suppose we consider the general perturbation problem where I have an H0 plus uh, a perturbation W, lambda W, and I take W to be a positive operator. For example, the Coulomb potential is a positive operator on a appropriate domain of, of wave functions for which the expectation value is well defined. Okay, so then I can take the expectation value of this expression with psi and get this relation. And now what I do is to extend lambda into the complex domain. Okay, then all these numbers here, uh, the expectation values are, are real numbers but the energy gets an imaginary part and lambda gets an imaginary part. And the relation between the imaginary part of E and the imaginary part of lambda is this equation with the prefactor that is actually positive. So this function has the, has the property that, that if the imaginary part of lambda is positive, then the imaginary part of E of lambda is positive. And that's a complex function that is named, that has actually a name in mathematics, it's called the nevan lina function. Uh, which is a Finnish guy, a Finnish mathematician. Okay. So anyway, there is a theorem in mathematics that says any entire, that means everywhere analytic nevan lina function must necessarily be of the form a plus b lambda where a and b are complex numbers. So it's, it is a purely linear function. So, so unless your perturbation theory is trivial, which it is, for example, when your perturbation commutes with h zero, um, you're bound to have singularities. That's just the conclusion of this. So perturbation theory in terms of the Coulomb interaction can have at most a finite convergence radius. So for example, when you do atoms or molecules, typically the convergence radius is indeed finite. Um, take for example, the Hubbard dimer, it has, it has a, a branch cut, an algebraic singularity at, at U is 2T or something like that. Um, and if you go to infinite systems, then the, the radius can converge to zero. And that was actually the Dyson remark. If you have the electron gas with repulsive interactions, you make the interactions attractive. It becomes a bit like gravity. You get, you get lumps of matter. It's a non-analytic point. So probably the converg convergence radius is zero. It's not an, uh, uh, a mathematical proof. It's, it's, um, it's a physical argument. Anyway, this is just a point I want to make. So in, in general, um, we're dealing with, with uh, series that converge up to a point. Okay. Robert, then, hmm? sorry, I mean, there's Francesco is posing a question about right. uh, the previous slide. Yes. I, I will read it. So what is in this case, the perturbation small thing, if lambda is complex, Francesco. 
Yeah. Francesco, maybe you can ask because I don't understand exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Just uh, a curiosity. When lambda becomes complex, yeah. Um, normally, in this perturbation uh, approach, uh, lambda is considered small, uh, such that uh, we can do perturbation theory, right? No, well, in this case, it's just uh, if lambda is complex, then psi is uh, is a is a complex function of lambda, so it's not more. It doesn't have to have be normalized and so and so on and so more. But uh, psi lambda exists for those lambdas. <clears throat> So there is no, um, so what this statement is, is essentially, I mean, E of lambda is a well-defined function. It's simply the, uh, the function that, yeah. So the eigenvalue equation or the E of lambda can be continued into the complex plane. That's what it is. Okay, and the psi is still not- Psi normalized. doesn't, no, psi is, is a psi, so if the, the inner product is real, but psi doesn't have to have norm one. That's why I divide it by psi rather than assuming that it's one. So the, the brackets are still real, but they don't. Okay, uh, brackets are still real, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. okay. <clears throat> okay so now I come to, to the issue of the, of the green function domain, essentially. So the green function has a temporal structure of Z, you can read them as times, um, where I have a theta function times a G greater, um, a, a particle propagator, and I have a theta function times a G lesser, a whole propagator, and they are of this form, the trace of a density matrix, a standard uh, Boltzmann type density matrix, for example, a type with a psi psi diagram. And uh, for example, the density response function has a similar structure. There are a lot of correlation functions in statistical physics that have this structure. Now, this is a special case of something rather general, which is called a Hilbert Schmidt type inner product. So, so you can define an inner product between operators A and B by the trace of rho, a positive operator or a positive semi-definite operator with A dagger B. So this has the kind of standard properties of an inner product. It's linear in the second argument. It's uh, anti-linear in the first argument. Uh, and the norm of, of a vector, a vector is A, uh, is positive. Um, and this is enough to, for example, prove a Cauchy-Schwarz type inequality. So this is a, a structure that you can, that the green function obeys, the particle whole propagator obey. Um, it's also discussed in one paper by Haar. Mm -hmm. Now, if the operator rho is actually a strictly positive operator, then we're actually dealing with a proper inner product because then if the norm of A is zero, then also the operator A is zero. If the uh, rho is positive semi-definite, so it can also be zero, um, also have zero eigenvalues, then we're dealing with a positive semi-definite Hermitian form as it is. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, so what we're going to do in the following is for the domain of the various functionals of the G that we'll consider, we'll only allow green functions for which the particle hole propagators are of these positive semi-definite Hermitian forms. Okay. Um, later we'll show a diagrammatic way of ensuring that. Um, and this is a generalization of something I, I worked on before called PSD perturbation theory. But it turns out there is a nice underlying property so what is the consequence of that? Um, okay, let me first in, go intermediate. So this also has actually an interesting physics viewpoint that, that um, if you consider such a, such a Hilbert-Schmidt inner product, let's say a, a typical one is an operator A at T1 and then a Heisenberg operator A at T2 of this form, then we can insert a complete set of states and we see it's, it's a sum of, um, no, it's actually a vector inner product of a vector alpha with itself at two different times, weighted with positive R0 numbers, or OK, it's positive semi-definite operator. And each of these alphas is actually a scattering in amplitude from, from an in-state K to an out-state N, OK? So what you can do is, if this is say, a field operator, you can expand the Hamiltonian in powers of the interaction and you can actually associate with each such amplitude, you can associate a diagram, okay? So if you insert a complete set of states, say at 
time infinity or time minus infinity, depending on, on what time contours you use. Then you, you can associate a diagram, for example, of this type. This is a piece for the cell of energy where you have time T1 that belongs to alpha T1 and the time T2, alpha T2, where you can actually expand these amplitudes. And after you have expanded the amplitudes, you take this, this product and see, you see, for example, at equal time, you get a positive number. Um, yeah, and this is essentially a way of doing perturbation theory by expanding scattering amplitudes. So you first evaluate the scattering amplitude and then you take the squares. And then you are guaranteed that you have a many body correlator of the appropriate positive semi definite Hermitian form. Okay, so this is the physics viewpoint, which actually relates quite closely to something that is called Fermi's golden rule, where you also expand in, in amplitudes. Okay, so this is the physics viewpoint. Now, what's the consequences of that? It has a, a few interesting consequences. For example, the density is guaranteed to be positive. Um, the one particle density matrix is guaranteed to be a positive operator. If you also do it for the G greater, which is one minus the density matrix, that's also a positive operator. That means that the occupation numbers are between zero and one, provided that it disintegrates the right particle number, which it does for a conserving scheme. So you can say that in the PSD conserving scheme, the one RDM that is calculated from the Green's function is actually ensemble and representable, which is, for example, true for time dependent GW, self consistent time dependent GW. Um, and other consequences, inequalities like this, and a third consequence is the thing that inspired the whole business, which was the positivity of the spectral function. But another consequence, for example, relating back to, to Lodinger work functionals and so on, is that the grand potential is a single valued function. So the logarithm doesn't generate any difficulties. To, there is never a crossing of a branch cut and so on. So yeah, so you see that this PSD Hermitian form is actually giving a lot of nice stuff and making a lot of functionals well-defined. So I would kind of propose this as the minimal domain restriction that we need to put on the Green's functions. Um, and I'll further see, see how this relates to the solvability of a few many body equations I, I mentioned too. One is, the, it goes back to time dependent DFT. One is the sham slutter equation. Now, what do you do in time dependent DFT? I will not go into all the tricky issues of defining time dependent DFT, but I just assume there is a Gonsham system that gives you the right density. So this is a Gonsham system, a non-interacting system, which has the property that it gives you the interacting density. The potential that does it is called the Gonsham potential and is split typically into the external potential and the remaining piece, the Hartian exchange correlation potential, which I just combine in one object for simplicity. Of course, this system is a proper physical system. So it has a, a green function, which is called um, the Gonsham Green's function GS, and it satisfies this equation. Now, if I do perturbation theory, I can decide which system I use as my zero to order state. So in particular, I can decide to use GS or the, or the HS system as my zero to order system. And if I do that, I get a Dyson equation that looks like this where I have V hard GX is subtracted in the integral. Now by construction, the density at equal times, or the green function equal times gives me the time dependent density, and so does the Gonsham one. So that means that at equal times, this object is the same as that object. So that means that this object is zero. And that gives me an equation that is known as the sham slutter equation. So this I can write in this form an integral kernel, which is essentially GS times G. And I have a right-hand side, which is GS sigma G. Okay. Um, so then I can ask the question, can I actually solve this integral equation? And this is a, a classical question in, in, in mathematics. Um, you can solve this equation, for example, if the right-hand side is in the range of this integral kernel. So Q has to be in the range of this integral kernel, otherwise I cannot find the solution. Um, and the other thing is the uniqueness. The uniqueness is guaranteed when the, the null space, so the, the, the kernel of this integral kernel 
uh, is zero. Now the, the kernel of integral kernel is not exactly zero because a pure gauge will will not induce any density. So so we say that the solution is unique if the if null space of the kernel only contains the pure gauge. Um, however, we remember that this is derived by the condition that um, the density of the interacting and non-interacting system ha are the same. So, so if I use uh, an approximation for sigma, and I will show you some examples of that, for which the density is not guaranteed to be positive, then I have a discrepancy because for the conscience system, it is always positive. And that would mean that this condition, Q in, in the range of K is not satisfied. So there are actually approximations for sigma that lead to non-solvability of the sham filter equation. Um, and this is an issue. It's not true for, for the GW approximation, not true for second born, but it's, it's true for some vertex beyond the simplest approximations. So I'll give you an example. This is a paper I wrote with Daniel Carlson with some examples where we did something stupid just out of principle, okay? So we said, this is a standard second born approximation. We took a simple Anderson impurity model, simple, a single side connected to an infinite lead. Um, we solved the second born equation for that. This can be shown to be a PSD scheme, a positive semi definite scheme. However, if you only take the exchange diagram, which is a really non physical thing to do, but we just do it to show uh, as a matter of principle what you get, then in fact you get a spectral function that at first iteration looks pretty horrible, gets very negative, and then the particle number, if you integrate it, also becomes negative on the side. Now, this thing actually can still be solved self consistently. Uh, and you get a spectral function that actually does convert to something, but it has a negative piece. If you would make the interaction stronger than we did, then even that is not possible anymore. We cannot find the dice for solve the Dyson equation anymore. Um, yeah, and how is this related to the properties of the green function? Now here we put the green function, which is just a scalar in this case. Uh, we plot it in the complex plane. Um, and here we plot it for letting omega run from minus infinity to mu to the chemical potential. So it starts in zero. This is the, this is the full second born, nice positive spectral function. It moves around and it stays in the upper plane. It stays in the upper half plane, which is a nice condition. This is guaranteed by PSD-ness. If you do first iteration with only the exchange diagram, we move all the way around. We got a negative plane also badly. We cross, we cross the negative axis. So that means that the logical word functional jumps with two pi i. So, so you would see that if you shift epsilon, we get jumps in the particle number by integers. Um, the fully self-consistent one goes into the negative plane, which is not good, but it doesn't cross the negative, um, negative axis. So that prevents some troubles. But anyway, this is one of the consequences of non, non psd Um And then the thing that actually inspired most of the things that we wanted to do um, is to look at the electron gas beyond, um, beyond the GW. Um, yeah, so the paper that actually inspired me to look at this thing was a paper by Rosa Pavliuk with Rubio and Baragdar, um, where they looked at the electron gas and, and the different processes that can appear when you actually go beyond GW. Okay, so there is actually a lot of interesting physics in phase space going on that is not included in GW, like the generation of two plasmas, the generation of plasma and particle hole pairs, and the generation of two particle hole pairs. So so we thought, why don't we actually solve um, the Dyson equation with the next diagram? Okay, it's kind of natural. You have an expansion in G and this is W. Why don't we include simply the next one and solve it? And how hard can it be? It's just a homogeneous electron gas. <laughs> this is not that hard. But um, turns out that it was not so easy. So when we, we started to do that, okay, it, first of all, there's one motivation. It, it is well known that, and this was done by Bengt Holm and Ulf von Bart when I, back when I was in Lund even, they solved GW um, for the electron gas in a self-consistent scheme. And they found out that this is in general, not really a good idea to do because 
the spectral functions turned out to be pretty bad. Okay, the last month features are smeared out. It's it's nothing like the properties of the simple metals. But then the idea was, okay, maybe you have to in, introduce vertex corrections and then the combination of vertex corrections with GW will cancel out things. Now I will come back to that issue later because I, in fact, there is some truth in that. But when we started to try to do that and did the first iteration with this one, we bumped into an issue that we then found out later, was already found, um, found by Petter Minhagen back in 1974, that if you try to do that, and this is from his paper, you find the spectral function gets negative. But not only negative, you get poles in the upper half plane. So that means that if you do the next iteration, you get more poles in the upper half plane and more and more and nothing converges anymore. So you couldn't even solve the equation self-consistently. Okay, so that is a bad thing. So we cannot solve the equation. Then we started to think about this more deeply and thought we have to ensure that the spectral functions and also the rate functions so the spectral functions of the self energy are positive at every step and we thought about it it reminded us of some things that Carl Amblad in the past used to say and, and, and studied in photoemission spectroscopy is that you have to somehow use use the cutting rules for the diagrams to to ensure this property and we didn't never i never understood what carl meant by that but when we started to think about it ourselves we kind of rediscovered it and it's the following thing and i here i actually go to a non-equilibrium formalism why do i go to a non-equilibrium formalism even an equilibrium system it's because in a non-equilibrium formalism you can actually expand the spectral function directly so you have a direct expansion of the spectral function in diagrams you so you don't need to go first extract the time ordered one and then from that extract the spectral functions but you can do it directly and by this you have a lot of control so this is done on a on a Kelly's contour that is actually the one from Kelly's original paper that starts at minus infinity goes to infinity and back but this is not so relevant what it amounts to is that you have a contour with t minus that goes forward and t plus that goes backwards and, and you have green functions that are time ordered if both times on the forward branch and, and they are anti-time ordered as both on the backward branch and there are the mixed functions which are actually the interesting ones those are the spectral functions so and this you can also do for sigma you can expand sigma lesser this is a diagram that belongs to it the only thing that you have to do is that some of the interaction lines connect times on the forward branch and they always since the interaction is instantaneous there is always either a minus sign on both sides or a plus sign on both sides and then you get this kind of expansions okay so and the starting point is always a minus and the end point is a plus if you do g lesser and for g greater you swap the plus and minuses okay and then you can write in general you can write uh, um, a layman form also for the self energy and expand. I don't want to go in too much details because the principles are quite clear and the details are just annoying. So, so the, the principles are as follows. So you have an operator for the self in, in appearing in the self energy in a, in a Heisenberg form. And we insert a complete set of states now at, at plus infinity, which we take to be a set of non-interacting states or Slater determines if you want. And then you arrive at, at this, actually this, um, positive semi-definite Hermitian form structure, where these are now embodied Green's functions that you can, can expand. And then you can show that, that you can include these diagrams also together using some, some properties of the, of the cutted lines to get the standard self energy diagrams. Okay, I don't want to go too much into that because the principles are simple and the principles are essentially this, okay? Um, if you take a diagram sigma or sigma lesser and you, you cut a diagram in two pieces, if both pieces have the same topology, then you have to form A times A star, then it's PSD, nothing needs to be done. But sometimes it's of the form A B star. If you cut it in two, the left hand side doesn't look like the right hand side, has a different topology. What we do, we add A and B, we multiply with A and B star, and we get a bunch of terms, which means that. We have the original diagram plus three new ones. And then we take that as our new sigma, it will be PSD. 
So, and the actual procedure is just a slightly more sophisticated version of this simple idea. So, so for example, forget about the left-hand side, it's an old slide. Um, if you take this diagram from, from the second born, we cut it in two, the pieces are exactly the same. This is a PSD diagram. Now we take the exchange diagram, we cut it in two, one piece and other piece. They look the same topologically, however, the momenta are different or, or the labels, because they have to be in momenta. It's, they are permuted. Then from the rules, we, then the rules that we derived is simply say that we have to permute the momenta and add it. And then we get a PSD approximation. And this gives you the standard second bone. Okay. So if you take only this, then the minimal extension that is PSD is, is, is the second bone approximation. And this you can also do for GW. So this is the second or the GGG WW. So we take the next diagram that we were interested in for the electron gas. You figure out the different plus and minus combinations, and then we start cutting. And then we find out after gluing and cutting together that we need extra diagrams taken together we find that we need all of this. Okay, so we go to fourth order in W. However, it turns out that this can actually be written out rather nicely. So the structure is as follows, that the sigma PSD has three pieces. One we call AA, which is essentially GW with two renormalized points. So this, this triangle is this plus a vertex. So we have a renormalized GW. Then we have an extra diagram where we also have the renormalized vertex in two points. And this is of the form where I have a minus, minus plus plus. This we call sigma A, A bar. A is, if you cut, we get A, but we can also get A where we have an interchange of two labels. That's why it's called A bar. And we have another diagram where the plus minus combination is different. Those are these two. But now since the half diagrams, when you cut, they represent physical processes. So you can actually analyze which physical process it is. Um, so this actually diagram corresponds to a whole state that scatters into um, two particle plus one whole state. These two diagrams correspond to the generation of two plus ones. And this is just renormalized GW. Okay, so, so we started actually to evaluate this diagram. So first uh, we thought well, this is not so easy to do, but Yaroslav has this nice Monte Carlo integration scheme where you actually can calculate Feynman diagrams by Monte Carlo integration. Oh, but sorry, hmm? so Francesco is asking if uh, this scheme is general. Given a diagram, is it uh, always possible to complete it to become a PSD set of diagrams? Yes, it always. Because uh, you, it's like saying I have, uh, uh, yeah, it's exactly what I'm saying. I have A star, if I cut it and the pieces are not the same, I take A plus B and, and it's, and it's okay. going. So there is even a scheme that says, this is the minimal extension that gives you the diagram. It's always possible. Yeah. And this minimal extension always guarantee you to have these properties you, um, you said at the beginning, it means a, a positive density, uh, and somewhere in representability. Then and some representability is a combination of PSD and, and particle conservation. And particle so, conservation. Plus yeah. a, a positive and, spectrum. And positivity is always there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. So then we started to evaluate these diagrams by iteration. Then we found that if we do the first iteration of all this, including the vertex, um, there are a lot of cancellations. So it turns out that that going from replacing G0 by the first iteration towards GW, the, the G0, W0, G, leads to a lot of cancellation that leaves the results almost the same. So then it turns out that I've actually replaced the triangles by dots and just use G0s, so we get almost the same result and it's PSD. So, and that's just these three diagrams. It's, it's actually two pieces of the added diagram. Moreover, actually, this diagram turned out to be really easy to evaluate because these this plus minus combinations are essentially delta functions in frequency time. So that turned out to be rather nice because it means that you don't have to do self consistently, presumably, because we, of course we didn't iterate all the way further. 
Um, but if you do that, you, you see that you get really nice quality spectra. So here we evaluated the rate function or the spectral function of sigma. Then you see that there are different diagrams. So, so this AA bar is, is this diagram. And then you can typically split the, um, the W into, uh, into a piece that, that is in the particle hole continuum and a piece from the plasmon. Okay, so in this way you can actually distinguish physical processes in with these colors here. So here you see that, that here we are at the Fermi energy, we go a bit away from the Fermi energy and you see different scattering processes to appear. If you go high enough in energy, you have the generation of one plasmon. If you go even higher in energy, there is a, a new window opening for, for scattering processes, which is the generation of a second plasmon. Then there are mixed processes possible where you have a plasmon, a particle hole pair or two particle hole pairs and so on. So, so this is actually the nice thing about this, this way of doing the diagrams that with each such diagram, you can, can associate um, a process. So you can decide by adding or remove a process rather than, than going by orders and perturbation theory. What you also see is that there are, for example, negative contributions, which are these ones. But if you add them all up, so which is the black line, it's, it stays positive, which is, of course, guaranteed by, the, by construction guaranteed. Okay, so this is how we do design the whole thing but you see there is negative contributions and and, and they add up okay um yeah and then you do calculations so for example if you do this for the electron gas this is the g0 w0 spectral function as a function of k and and, and omega you get a you get a plasmon you get a quasi particle branch but if you do the vertex you get two plasmons and you get a quasi particle branch that is slightly different. We wash out the plasma with higher energies. But we also, for example, interestingly, you reduce the bandwidth by 27%, uh, which is actually an issue that people are discussed in, in the sodium crystal where they see this, this happening. And um, um, yeah. So that was actually quite nice because, of course, the electron gas is not the same as the sodium crystal, but that it offers a possible explanation for this for this effect, uh, which is to, yeah, the verdict correction it can be, possible, okay, yeah, can is possible to reduce uh, the bandwidth. Okay, now the issue of dressing versus vertex corrections. Um, now, if you look at, at, at one of these rate functions again, the, the spectral function of sigma, we see that, that there are two contributions close to the Fermi energy. Oh, but sorry, I interrupt you again. Yeah. So there are Simon uh, who is asking the question, is the PSD condition related to the unitary of the S matrix, like cutting rules in field theory? Yes, it is. So, so, um, this is, I think, is well described in this book by Veltman that I cited, the book Diagrammatica. Um, of course, in, in quantum field theory, you want that the number of particles that, that enter the system, or you want that probability for different processes is preserved, that you cannot have something that is more probable than one. Okay, So this is the condition of, of um, positivity of the... Um, S matrix. Now, people in quantum field theory, of course, they have much more troubles than in non-relativistic theory because they have the normalizations, all that, have defined rules called Kutkowski rules um, that uh, ensure that the S matrix is, is unitary. Um, so we do something very similar, except that, that we also introduce a procedure to repair if it's not so, so that's the minimal extension procedure, but it's essentially the same thing. Yeah. So the, the unitarity of the S matrix is essentially the same as the positivity of the spectral function. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. So I was talking about the Fermi energy. So the, there are two contributions close to the Fermi energy. One is the standard GW contributions, which are these blue things, the plus one and electron hole contributions from, from GW. And there is only one other contribution, and that comes from this, this diagram that we call AA bar, 
uh, that actually gives a negative contribution, but, but in this region, it's, the other pieces are positive enough to keep everything positive. Okay, so now we wanted to kind of study the, the vertex corrections in the uh, low energy regime. So you could, for example, study what is the effect of vertices on quasi-particle lifetimes, for example. So we started to look at that. And then we consider two cases. Um, I should go back because this, we actually study the effect of screening. So we can say, suppose this interaction line is W and suppose this interaction line is just a bare interaction. What, what do we get from that? So, so what is the effect of screening? So the first case I will discuss is just this diagram where this is the, the bare interaction. And then you can calculate the rate function, so the spectral function of sigma. And so what you find that it's, it's negative, we already knew that it's negative, but it's negative with, with a small momentum with large negative spikes, very large negative spikes. And this is rather problematic because in, in perturbation theory, you want that the whole thing is positive. So. And these large negative spikes, they can actually be interpret, interpreted physically. So if you, because this describes a scattering process from from a hole to two holes plus one particle. And you can actually analyze that in, in, in momentum energy space, the phase space of that. So you have scattering mechanisms in the Fermi sphere. I will not go to into the details, but it turns out that there are two important ones. One is, is called a, a backward scattering and one is a forward scattering. And, and, and for forward scattering, there is very little phase space close to the Fermi energy. And this gives a rise to, to actually a peak in the rate function, a sharp peak, you can analyze. However, in a screened electron gas, these processes are heavily screened by, by plasmons. So this thing will not happen if you do the screening. So, so one of these conclusion is that if you don't do screening, you get these large negative peaks. But if you now go to the screening case, where we have an, an RPA screening in, in the vertex diagram, so here you see that the, the black line is, is the one from the bare interaction, that the contribution of the plasmon, which is the red line here, is if you subtract those, cancels exactly the sharp peak here. And so that the total contribution due to screening is a smooth function, okay? And that was exactly that smooth function here, the yellow function here. So, so you see that a simple RPA screening gives actually a very small rate function. So, so one of the conclusions is that consistent dressing so, is important to obtain the physically correct results in the diagrams. And this is an issue for some approximations that people considered, for example, the, people consider the Sussex diagram, which I don't really understand so much, but <laughs> there you have a diagram with one bare and one, one interacting line. This will have the same negative spikes in the spectral function. It will lead to a non-PSD scheme with large negative spikes. In the energy, this is maybe less important. Maybe that's the same the case for GW. In GW, you have a bad spectral function, a good energy. This might be true also for this one. I don't know. But, but yeah, it's something to take into account that consistent dressing is important. And um, so you cannot just do vertices, the vertices has to have to be done in a proper way. Okay, and then there are some results that I just skipped. I mean, the general conclusion is that this diagram reduces the quasi-particle lifetimes, but since all kinds of quantum Monte Carlo kind of disagree on this and our line is somewhere in between, yeah, what can I say? And what, what we really need is, is uh, benchmark results on the electron gas spectral functions, which do not exist, unfortunately. Okay, now I come to this issue of PSD-ness and conserving approximations. So in general, the approximations are not both conserving and PSD. However, a few of them are, so okay. <laughs> so GW is, is one. Um, so if, if both the particle hole propagates are calculated in the PSD, normal conserving approximation, the same one, then, then this is an ensemble and residential object. So, so for example, self-consistent GW is such one, self-consistent T matrix, self-consistent second one, all given density matrices with occupation numbers between zero and one, that the trace of which is N. 
also some partially self-consistent screen donut like GW0 is a PSD scheme and it's number conserving. It's not energy conserving, it's not momentum conserving, but it's number conserving. Uh, G0, W0 is, is PSD, but it's not number conserving. It means that the density matrix is positive, but the trace is not necessarily N, except for small enough system. If you would do the hover dimer, it probably would be because the phase space is too small. But <clears throat> in general, it is not. So that's actually nice. Okay, so we're back at the density matrix now. So, so I think it's a kind of curious, interesting thing that these issues that people discuss in one matrix functional theory, like an ensemble inflexibility, come back in Green's function theory in terms of this Hermitian um, form structure of the Hilbert Schmidt inner products. Okay, back to BBJKY then, because we're going back at the one matrix. <clears throat> now, the derivation of this slide was not based on any of these considerations that I had before. We were just interested in, in saving computing time when we decided to develop this. The kind of Bame equations, which is the time propagation of the non equilibrium green function, is a propagation in two times. That's time consuming on the computer. Okay, so then we thought, can't we do one time equations? Um, Yes, you can do. And um, this was already figured out by these three guys from, from the Czech Republic, Lipovsky, Spichka, and Velichki, that proposed something that they called the generalized kind of BAM approximation. Now, first, if we just simply co consider the equation of motion of, of G lesser, then it's of this form, where I, it's called the collision integral, is an integral over some, pro some functions like sigma lesser, the G advanced Green's function, the retarded sigma, and the G lesser Green function. Now, what you would like is to express this thing in, in terms of one-time objects. Okay, so, so what is the density matrix? It's often called rho. Rho is the equal time limit of G. So this is a matrix in, in position space or, or, or orbital space, if you want. Now, the equation motion of rho, which is the first BBJKY, is this collision integral. Now the collision integral involves integrations over two time objects. So, so, so formally you cannot really close this because this is a one time object. This side contains two times object. However, in the hartree fock approximation, you can actually calculate the G lesser from the retarded and, and the density matrix is this expression. This is the retarded Green's function. This is the density matrix. This is that fast. And in the hartree fock approximation, the retarded Green's function is the evolution operator with the hartree fock Hamiltonian. And the hartree fock Hamiltonian only depends on the one particle density matrix. So that means that all the objects in the collision integrals are actually functionals of the one matrix in the hartree fock approximation. This is not true, of course, in second-born CW and so on, but we can make the ansatz. And so we can make the ansatz. We can say, suppose that G lesser, G greater are of this form. It's probably not too crazy if the Green's function is not too correlated. So, so it's close to mean field. And then the correlations anyway come in via the collision integrals, okay? So, so if I simply take this as an ansatz, which the Czech guys called the GKBI ansatz, then <clears throat> you can actually plug it in the right hand side of the equation and, and actually solve the whole thing. And this you can do. So this is actually a one, a one particle density matrix functional. If you look at it, we never looked at it this way because we always saw it as a way of, of just approximating kind of BAME and it works really well to calculate absorption spectra. It allowed us to calculate actually real systems in real basis sets like actual molecules rather than Hubbard models. Um, yeah. So another interesting thing is that in these approximations, the GKBA is actually conserving scheme. It's number conserving. You can prove that. And more or less it's PSD. So that means that if you solve the GKBA equations in second born, GW, etc., you get a one matrix that is guaranteed to be ensemble representable. You never get negative functions like we had in this BBJKY scheme and we tried different decoupling schemes. Um, and this is actually a case where actually the spectral function is obtained as a one RDM functional. 
So I must say that the quality of the spectral functions is not as good as of the absorption spectra. And that's because essentially the whole derivation, putting the times equal is actually, yeah, you actually interested by construction of the approximation in terms of in, in number conserving excitations. So it's not so surprising that, this, that these spectral functions are less, but still you can calculate. And this has been applied to many, many papers. Now I just mentioned the most recent one that I know from my friend Gianluca, which is in some paper, on the, they should charge migration in some biomolecule. And in one paper that I was involved myself, so I know better about it, so people can ask me about it. When you do, you do transient spectroscopy of molecules, where you, you, you first hit uh, no, you hit actually it's just at atoms. You hit krypton atoms with the uh, with the strong pulse that might ionize the system, and then you, with the time delay, you put a weak pulse, and then you measure how much of it is ionized. So then you can follow the ionization in time. And this is called transient absorption spectroscopy. And it turns out that if you do correlated approximations, you get exactly the features they measure in the experiment. If you do Hartree-Fock, you don't get them. So it's it's. It's really, it has been really a, a useful approach. Then furthermore, Robert, realized, sorry, can you yeah. already know uh, when these ansatz will uh, fail? I mean, based on the approximation that you are using, can you already know the field of validity? Yeah. Um, so here we have um, a, a, a propagator, which is actually a hartree fock propagator. Although the input, gamma is obtained from the cell consistent equation so it knows about the correlations although so it but of course um, when the mean field approximation is yeah i mean yeah so in some sense you need to have um, a more or less satisfactory one body theory to start your perturbation theory with i think so so for molecules that is probably okay uh, because mm -hmm. the, the different level structure are brought in by by the collision integrals, so the, the, the correlation process, the scattering processes. But one thing you can do to improve, and we found that this actually improves if you do, for example, quantum transport, is to replace the Hartree Fock by, say, a quasi, some kind of quasi particle propagator. Okay. Because it's not only this, I mean, okay, this is uh, the approximation to GR, but then you also have the ansatz itself. Yeah, true. That's yeah, so the answer itself simply says that mm. the G letter is of this, this form. Mm. And that you can not do much about it unless you... Actually, it's, it's not true. <laughs> I cannot, can do so. Actually, the answer can be seen in as a first term in, in some kind of um, explicit solution to the kind of BAME equations in integral form. So if you start iterating, you get the first... This is actually how the uh, Spitschka and other people derived that this information. So, it's so you can go beyond, but then you start introducing more time integrals again, which is okay. exactly what we wanted to avoid. So, but well, okay. I mean, uh, I am sure um, it can be improved, but mm -hmm. it works pretty well. It works for all kinds of things. It works much better than TDDFT for molecules. So, I mean, TDLDA so should be precise. Okay. Um, okay. Then another interesting development is that, so formally, you still have to calculate the collision integrals, which is a time integral, and you have to do it for every time in, G, in, the, in the density matrix. So formally, it's a, for a scheme that is T squared. Well, it has been realized recently mainly by, by people in the Bonitz group in Kiel, that um, actually you can actually transform this equations from integral equations to ordinary differential equations by introducing new quantities. And that's a huge speed up in practice. So it was already a speed up from one time, but now we have a huge speed up by going to linear time. So that's why they published this paper in PRL last year. Um, and so in fact, it becomes, it becomes, it becomes competing with standard TDDFT in this way. Of course, there is now the, the main bottleneck now is not the time propagation anymore. The main bottleneck now is the basis set. So you have to calculate uh, two electron integrals. But also there, there has been progress. So there's people like Iran Rabani in Berkeley and Roy Baer in 
Jerusalem and so on and so on. They have this uh, stochastic scheme for propagating real-time green functions. So they, they started to study the kind of BAME equations and figured out that you actually can use spatial scaling schemes also for the kind of BAME equations. And that means that if you combine these schemes together, you really open up the possibility to study actually real materials out of equilibrium in linear scaling schemes in space and time. And I think that's a pretty exciting development. So yeah, so let's see what this, what this brings. <clears throat> okay, so now I come to finally to the conclusions of my talk. So, so this is more like by yeah, discovering things by, by bouncing into problems. So in going beyond the simplest approximations, we encounter issues with the solvability of self-consistent equations due to violation of the PSD condition. We didn't know that this was the essential reason, but this is something that we discovered going along. And oh, this should be restricting. Restricting the input of the self-energy functional to the domain of PSD green functions, several of these issues can be resolved. So you get actually equations that have solutions. The PSD approximation beyond GW are of a simple nature, actually. So as I showed for the electron gas, the corrections are relatively simple. And can within, oh, ah, it should be without, of course, but again, can, without too many difficulties be implemented in first principle code. So yeah, so I would be interested to think about that. Um, actually, we did actually a, a few systems. We did a single and bilayer, bilayer graphene in a recent paper. No, okay, that's not a general system. Um, yeah, and another important that I find really cute and interesting and, and nice from a physicist's point of view is that an important feature of this perturbation theory that it allows to do perturbation theory in physical processes rather than in orders of the interaction. So you can say, I want, now, so for example, I want the third plasma. I know exactly which diagram to add now. And then I have to maybe complete the stuff to get it PSD, but I know exactly which diagram has the right, the right physics for, for getting that. So, and that's quite close to original, the original year of Feynman when he proposed green functions. He was saying, well, there is this scattering mechanism and that scattering mechanism. I have an in-state, I have an out-state, I calculate implicit. So the Feynman rules were there before, before the actual derivation. The actual derivation was done by Dyson later. So now we, in some long circle, you get actually back to, to that thing. And I think this is just a prediction, but I, okay, it's always hard to make predictions about the future, um, that this will be actually a serious competitor to various existing TDDFT approaches. And then I haven't said anything about strongly correlated problems. I would say it still remains a hard problem. I only see maybe ways of connecting to beta Peter and other schemes to to do this, but uh, this is rather vague. So yeah, and with this, I just finished my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Robert. Um, so now we can uh, ask questions. I must say that I apologize with the C fright because I asked a question during the, your mm -hmm. talk and I didn't, uh, I didn't ask it. So maybe, um, Maybe you can ask it yourself because I do not know which slide you refer to. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, actually my question was wrongly posed. I asked, um, is- uh, it's, it's you. Sorry? It's you, Christoph. Yeah, it's me, hello people. Sorry, couldn't see, okay, hi, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, I didn't put my first name, second name. Um, yeah, my, my question was wrongly posed. I asked, is E lambda a nevan linear function or the imaginary part of E lambda? Uh, e lambda itself. It's, I mean, a function lambda. in complex analysis is called a nevan linear function if, if the function has the same sign as the imaginary part of its argument. Of the imaginary function, uh, if M, M of FZ <laughs> has the same sign as MZ. Mm. That's the definition. So, okay, um, what, what confused me there is, I mean, it, this looked like normal perturbation theory. You could, you could think of, of, of a static perturbation theory. And uh, then uh, the eigenvalue would also have quadratic terms and cubic terms and quartic terms and so on in, in the perturbation. So yeah, I didn't... exactly, because it's a non-analytic function. function. I'm just saying that 
I'm not saying E of lambda is a linear function. It's only a linear function if it's analytic everywhere. That's the fear. Uh, if it's analytic everywhere, then it is in a necessarily is linear. Ah, uh, then it's linear. Uh, then it's linear. Okay, okay. And the conclusion is, since we never converged in first order in practice, yeah. we never uh, we never have an analytic function. So that means that at some point you must encounter a singularity. It could be a logarithmic branch cut. It could be a quadratic branch cut, like, like a square root. But you will bump into a branch cut. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and that's the statement. So perturbation theory for a positive operator as a perturbation cannot converge unless it's a trivial perturbation that breaks off after one term. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, then there's a Trond, Sawe. Uh, Trond, you can ask the, the question yourself. And then Mark, I saw you. OK, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so thanks for a nice uh, presentation, Robert. Um, there was uh, some years ago uh, work on the two electron reduced density matrices by Masiotti uh, using semi definite programming, so SDP, uh, and you have PDS. Uh, <laughs> I guess there is a link. Can you uh, comment on that? Yeah, vaguely, because, uh, okay, so um, yeah, there is a link, of course, um, but I mean, I, so yeah. So, so PSD means uh, PSD in many ways. So positive semi-definite. So, so, so my functions that I use are functions of space and time. So the operators are operators in space and time. So they are uh, matrices in sp in space-time points, like like G one two. And that means that they are positive semi-definite functions in space and time. So if you restrict the times to be the same, it's it's PSD in space, and then you get the positivity of the one matrix. Or if you say it's uh, say it's e put x and x prime the same, then it's PSD in time, and then you get the positive to the spectral function. So it's it's taking these functions on um, on a bigger domain, if you want, or a bigger argument domain. Uh, what Mazziotti does is is actually looking at the density matrices in uh, in space, but not. Mm, not a one-time object that I did, but a two-time object. Well, this is perfectly the same, of course, because what I did for the one-particle Green's function can also be done for the two-particle Green's function. So and these cutting rules are rather general. Um, yeah. And then I guess he has a variational approach, and you have uh, you're more, more in the frame of perturbation theory. Uh, yes, um, it's well. He does essentially ground state theory. There is no direct connection to, to diagrams there. It's purely variational. Uh, so there are some analogies, but there are also important differences, I would say. So, so the, um, yeah, the fact that I deal with time dependent objects is a big difference because there is, you have, there is not a natural structure of a time dependent Hilbert space. Time is a parameter. So I think that's where the, the basic different mathematical structure goes up, but, but indeed you need a positivity of the density matrices in space at every time point. So this is an uh, representability an end representability condition. Thank you. Okay, we have Mark. Uh, yeah, can you hear Mark, me? Yeah, yes, you can ask a question and then Simon. Okay, um, thanks for the talk, Robert. I have a question about the norm of the wave function and the Green's function. <clears throat> so I don't really work on the transport problem, but uh, the whole thing is kind of built around the idea of a conserved current. Um, so, of course, the time evolution of the wave function goes into a much higher dimensional space than, than is observable. Mm -hmm. So how am I supposed to think of kind of a conserved current matching up with the time evolution operator. You had said a couple things at the beginning that were interesting uh, that sort of suggested you treat the wave function and the Green's function as kind of different. Of course, they're different objects, but it's almost sounded like they belong to different formalisms. Um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So there are two things, yeah. So so the wave function lives in n-particle Hilbert space, and this is a really nice space because 
you have the superposition principle, you can add stuff. Uh, evolution is unitary in a nice right. way. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, yeah, so, and the Green's function, on the other hand, is a transition amplitude. It's, it's a matrix element between between involved green functions in some mm -hmm. way. So, so it's, it's in this sense, it's already quadratic in the green function, right? So it's, it's uh, because you have an in and an out in function. So, um, so in this sense, it, it, it doesn't naturally belong into a space in, in, in a vector space. You I mean, you typically don't add right. green functions. <laughs> G, uh, a G of one, uh, one green function plus another green function is not a new green function, but the state in Hilbert space plus another state in Hilbert space is a possible state in Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. Um, I think at most you can do is saying that you can take a convex combination of green functions that would, would be like choosing a, a density matrix to trace over of two green functions, which is quite close to DFT. Now coming back to the current, um, yeah, so there is a, actually a, a many body current, there is, there is a many body current in the, in the n particle Hilbert space, which is the, the n dimensional Laplacian acting on the or the free n dimensional nabla acting on, on psi, but there is also the one dimensional current, which is a, is a reduced quantity, which I can calculate from the green function. Yeah. Now, I don't really have a nice Hilbert space to, to guarantee nice stuff there, no, because um, yeah, the green function satisfies a rather complicated integral differential equation. So to ensure that the current is conserved, yeah, that's not an easy issue. That's the, the yeah. whole thing that Dame wrote a paper about with the phi derivability. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the answer. That's kind of what I, kind of what I understood. Yeah. Thank you. We go on. We have many, many questions. So, um, uh, a question from yeah. There's uh, I think first Simon and then uh, Felix uh, raised the hand. Oh man, you are really many. So let's uh, let's go with Simon first. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and I was going to ask about the uh, this uh, convergence of perturbation theory argument that mm -hmm. as long as lambda is uh, real, the uh, the whole Hamiltonian is uh, Hermitian, and so you can diagonalize it. But, but I'm wondering if once lambda, once you allow for a complex lambda, uh, and so for a finite matrix, you're only guaranteed to have the Jordan form with the with the string. So whether um, you know there's there's an issue here or, or no? I mean, it's obviously not Hermitian anymore, but yeah, uh, but, <clears throat> but E of lambda is uh, on the real axis a well-defined function, as you say, and that means it has a complex uh, con uh, analytic continuation, mm -hmm. and that's uniquely defined. So if you have a complex function defined on on, on the one-dimensional curve in, in the complex plane, you can do analytic continue it, and and uh, the same can be done for psi. So you can you can define psi of lambda for complex psi. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I'm wondering whether this might also be related to the uh, Dyson argument because because he assumed that if alpha is negative, then all hell breaks loose, right? And uh, yeah, also and he, he uses the effect of analyticity, which means that he makes alpha complex because otherwise you cannot talk about analyticity. Right, exactly. So alpha negative means that the electric charge which goes into the Hamiltonian becomes uh, pure imaginary. Right. So what happens is that you 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 would have the case that I have, for example, a negative branch cut and negative alpha, yeah. and I go I walk around it and I, I meet a branch cut, and that's an analytic point. So yeah, so it's the same. So, so you think basically you can continue this whole eigenvalue equation, every, everything in there, you can continue into, into the complex. Yeah, so if you, if you actually have an analyticity, you actually have to define it on multiple Riemann sheets because you go, <laughs> you go around in the complex plane in different ways. Yeah, so that's, uh, th that's the case, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe now Felix can ask a question. Yeah, actually, it's just a quick uh, comment. Uh, since you, you were complaining, uh, Robert, about the lack of benchmarks for the electron gas, Mm. So I, I just want to uh, point out that there is a recent paper mm. where um, the Z factor that you were showing and, and also the effective mass are computed uh, up to Rs equal four right. uh, by, by diagrammatic Monte Carlo. So it's, it's, it's not self-consistent, but it's a renormalized 
uh, perturbation theory up to the, the order five. So, so right. I will put the, the reference in, in the chat box. Yeah, I actually might have even, yeah, so it could be. Yeah, I put the reference, yeah. I don't know, I mean, I, I could be that we cited, but I, but I actually really would mean, apart from the Z factor and M star, of course, is that we would like to have a picture of the spectral function. <laughs> and that's, of course, a much harder question. So how does the spectral function look like? Because yeah, right. So for this, uh, you, you would need to do the analytic continuation. So yeah, this has not been done uh, so far. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. I hope somebody yeah invents something clever, something benchmark clever that we can use. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll take the last two questions are one from Stefan Rimmel Moser, I, I think. Stefan, maybe you can ask the question yourself and then Christian Bruder. And I think then we'll stop. Yeah, so I, uh, in your work on the spectral function for the homogeneous uh, electron gas, um, could you comment on the issue of uh, self consistency? Because as far as I remember, uh, for the GW Holm and uh, von Barth have shown that it completely destroys the spectral function. Yes, that's true. So, so the fact that you can solve it doesn't mean that the result is good. So that's, that's of course one one thing. Um, yeah. So, so that was actually a surprise because I was actually in Lund when Ulf was doing it with Bengt Holm. So I know exactly what they did uh, and and what they implemented. They did long derivations and, and, and nice uh, stuff. But they were, in the beginning they were very surprised about the results. So so. Um, yeah, so the result was that, for example, it's actually quite a bit better to do GW0 than GW for electron gas. The only thing that turned out to be really good for G self consistent GW was the total energy. So the correlation energies were really, really good, and the spectral function is really, really bad. And that's not so strange in principle because there are many cases of that. Um, because the energy is just a number, and the spectral function is, is, as, is a, yeah. Object with many features, so it's much easier to get the energy right uh, than than the spectral function. So because well things average out. So if you have an error here, you have an error there, and the energy expression it might average out. But then yeah, the question is why is it so bad? So and um, and people try to find an answer to that. There are some papers by um, by Jerry Mahan on that that says, well, you have to look at, for example, the word identity. The word identity relates the self energy to the vertex. And by violating the word identity, um, which you do in GW, um, yeah, you, you get bad results. There, is, there, is, there should be a certain cancellation between vertices and, 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 and self consistency. So that's why um, a long time ago, when I was still in, in Lund, Ulf said that. Yeah, we should maybe do the the second diagram, and this is also one thing that I had in back in mind. It's one of the reasons I started back doing that. But yeah, one thing that you can conclude is that that self consistency is not always possible, and when it's possible, it's not guaranteed to be good. <laughs> that's that's an issue. But that's a bit uh, sad. <laughs> yeah, so so I and that's why I was really pleased to get. This, this formalism where you can actually select physical processes because it's much nicer to do perturbation theory in physical processes because you have some kind of intuition of what to include and what physics you want. Uh, and that's much yeah. better than just guessing maybe the second order is better than, than the first order and the third order maybe better than the, the second order. But this is all kind of mathematical guesses, you know, it's not based on physics. Where it's, so it's, it's much nicer to say, I want. I want the double plus one, I want the triple plus one, I want a, a particle hole scattering of this type or that type. And I include it and I, you get it in the spectral function. And then if if you do do an experiment where you have some kind of idea that these are the physical processes that may be a role, play a role, you would try to do a calculation that includes that. It's a bit like people would do in particle physics when they do Compton scattering, they look at one particular Feynman graph. If they do some other scattering, they look at another Feynman graph. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe I can uh, now give the yeah the floor to Christian. Christian, maybe you can ask uh, your question, Christian Bruder. 
Christian. Christian, you are always there? Maybe got tired. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the, the, it's just a clarification. Uh, just to say that what I presented yesterday is in fact a framework with which you can decide whether the operations on diagrams presented by Robert are uh, mathematically valid or not. Because when renormalization is required, um, these operations are, are not valid. I mean, yes. the diagrammatic operations are not valid. And <clears throat> a point um, which is important is to, to, uh, to know that even non-relativistic um, field theory, quantum field theory has to be renormalized. And the, the leading expert of that is Vincent Rivasso, who used to be at uh, Polytechnic and um, made rigorous uh, renormalization of the Fermi liquid and uh, the Hubbard model. So uh, just to say that we must be careful because sometimes even in non-relativistic uh, field theory, uh, renormalization has to be uh, uh, considered. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would uh, certainly agree with that. So, so uh, I think the difficult case is really infinite systems. Yeah. For finite systems, uh, the green functions are well behaved. Of course, we have the issue of function space. And I just, so I don't solve the issue, I circumvent it. In this way, I would say. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's an important question. Mm -hmm how to make the whole formalism rigorous. Uh, I actually am not so concerned about it. I'm not just more concerned that if I run into trouble, can I solve the problem? <laughs> and this was the whole the whole issue of this PSD theory that not only it has problems, but kind of pointed out in the direction of what should we do with the green function. So, so what is the restriction that we should put on it? It's it's trying to define the function space. But I think, uh, yeah, maybe something can be done with, with some kind of Hilbert Smith theory for, for green functions in some, some cases. I don't know. But I agree with you. Okay, so maybe uh, we can stop here. Thanks, Robert, for the talk and uh, answering the question. So now we have a break. I guess, uh, I don't know what you think, Francesco, Julian, uh, Manu, we restart uh, at uh, 10 past four, maybe, just to have half an hour. <laughs>